live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering Cisco Live Europe. Brought to you by Cisco and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Cisco Live 2019 here in Barcelona, Spain. I'm Stu Miniman and my co-host Dave Vellante and John Furrier is here with us. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage going to all the areas of what Cisco is covering, their transformation, become more of a software company. Help us dig into a very exciting area. We have Nicola Rorsites, who's the lead strategic AI program at Cisco. Nicola, thanks so much for joining us. Nice to meet you. All right, so AI is something that, you know, pervading everything that we talk about. We definitely have the, the buzz and the hype in the industry. Uh, you sit at the nexus of all the different areas inside of Cisco. So, you know, give us a little bit about you know, your role inside the company. Uh, you've been there about two years and uh, kind of the, the scope of what you, you're, you're, you, you do there. AIML has a long history inside of Cisco. We have not been very vocal about it, but it's been used throughout the company. And uh, we once put together a map of all these things. This was one of my first activities. And I, I went, wow, it's amazing. In all of these products, we have some element of AIML. And, uh, this showed also that we have a very pragmatic approach to AIML. It's not this uh, killer robots or you name it. It's more like, okay, how do we use this to solve specific problems? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think back, you know, definitely analytics. You know, when you talk about networking and flows, you know, there's always been lots of data and I've had tools to be able to access th there. When I talk to most people in the industry though, there definitely is something new and different, you know. You know, AI is not new. We've been talking about artificial intelligence for about 150 years. Um, you know, machine learning. There, there's been movements on there. Uh, so may maybe you can give us, you know, what, what's what's the same as what we've had before, and, and what's new and different about you know the the era that we're in today and the the products that Cisco is bringing to market. It's a spectrum. On one side you have analytics. On the other side you have AI. And basically the uh, the fundamental difference is that in analytics. Usually it's accepted that it's the, it's the person that uh, creates the rules, that draws the rules. On your hand, the, in AI, it's the computer that draws the rules. So uh, in between those, there is a gray zone in which uh, you evolve and there's more and more done by the machine. But it really depends from the specific area in which you want to apply it. And uh, it is true, we are moving more and more, to, more towards uh, artificial intelligence, more by, uh, done by the machine. And the reason is clear, we have more and more data and up to a point in which AI will be the only option to do business, because everything needs to be automated. I want to ask you, uh, as an AI expert, when I talk to security experts, I always ask them who was your favorite superhero, because when they were little kids, they, they dreamt about saving the world. So, as an AI expert, did you think about artificial intelligence, or whatever you called it back then, as a, as a child? How did you get into and interested in artificial intelligence? I've been always fascinated by how the brain works. I did my PhD in neuroscience and physics because of that. Because when I was a kid, suddenly I thought, well, how do we think? How is this possible that we create stories in our mind and that we dream at night and wake up? And then uh, slowly, uh, little by little, I kept on asking the question, how do you make this into a technical solution? Like, how do you engineer something like this? And then started looking into computers, well, it's not like our brain works, so there's a difference. And now we're sort of like coming slowly together, uh, despite having started from very different uh, paths, from the new von Neumann machines and so on, now we're moving more, more and more to our brain-inspired technologies. And, and so you, you're seeing those two worlds come together. I mean, I was under the impression that, that despite that vision, that today's AI, anyway, is really a lot about maybe automating you know, processes, robotic process automation as an example, but you're talking about a world that, that much more mimics the human brain as we understand how the human brain works. Is that correct? It is correct in the sense that allow you want to mimic certain uh, fundamental capabilities. So intelligence is about perceiving information, storing knowledge, thinking, and adapting. And you need all these four components to create a truly intelligent system. And uh, you don't need to replicate individual neurons to make this happen, but at least understand the fundamental principle behind it. What's the computation like? And uh, as you go along, because we're in a business, we need to find concrete solutions to business challenges. And therefore, we apply whatever we, we need from these uh, uh, principles to make something out of it. What are the things that, that humans can do today that computers have trouble doing? A and and how is that changing? One of the clearest things is that the computers are not able to think. 
they are still executing machines, they don't have a representation of uh, what it means to, uh, to do whatever they're, they're doing uh, to solve their problems. And, uh, and um, one of the next steps, uh, which the researchers are very interested in now, is trying to understand uh, the context in which a machine operates. Now, if you ask a machine to do a certain task, and it can fail miserably because it's not able to connect the dots between different elements of the, of the context. And, and part of the reason is that context, contextual information is so broad and large, you have so much data, so which one do you pick? And this is still a, an unsolved problem. Yeah, Nicola, help, help us understand how we should think about Cisco when it comes to AI. People hear about you know, Facebook and Google and IBM with their Watson uh, pieces there. Uh, obviously things like you know, scale of networks and you know, managing uh, you know, infrastructure and moving to you know, some of these multi-cloud environments seem a natural fit for Cisco, but how, how should I as a, as a user be thinking of when do I come to Cisco, how does AI and ML fit into what Cisco does compared to you know, some of those other software and uh, enterprise uh, IT providers? So doing AI at Cisco is super exciting because it's still uh, an open field. AI ML for networking is something that has not been solved yet. And there are other areas where other companies uh, operate in, they are much more advanced. While for us, there's lots of room still to innovate. And for us, it's a, it's a business opportunity, it's a tremendous business opportunity. Um, some market research talks about $1.2 trillion uh, uh, dollars that's going to be captured by uh, companies that uh, adopt AI compared to those who don't. Uh, but for Cisco, it's, it's really a necessity because data is going to flow more and more through our networks. How do we handle that? And what people don't realize in general compared to what's out there, that ML for networking is a different beast. Uh, for one, the data is different and often it's encrypted. So how do you do a AI on encrypted data? And every network is unique. And these are two fundamental differences that uh, um, force us to be creative and to pioneer new ways of doing AI. And this is super exciting. Yeah, uh, d does open source play into the activities that, that, that your, your different product groups are, are working on? So in general, AI has, has been driven by a very uh, lively AI uh, community in the open source uh, world. And, and then the, the question comes when we, uh, we talk to our partner and customers, how do you bring these solutions to production? because certain uh, packages of open source cannot be applied directly. And this is one of, uh, of the main uh, pain points of the IT teams and data scientists and data engineers. I want to ask you about the black box phenomenon. Um, as a human, I can look at a dog and I can see it's a dog immediately, but I can't really explain how I know it's a dog. I, I can, but I could be describing another animal. Um, computers can figure out, but we don't really know exactly. It's like sort of a black box inside. Is that a problem? Um, do, do we need to make AI more transparent or is it increasingly going to be a black box that we just trust? What are your thoughts on that? It depends on the situation. Um, you came here by plane. Do you know exactly how the plane works? I don't, I sort of have, know the principles, but I trust the industry, the regulations, everything, that they, they have checked all, everything. And to me, it's a sort of, of black box. However, if there are certain things that I have to go under, like surgery, so I want to know exactly what's going on. <laughs> and uh, the same thing here uh, in AI. So there is uh, the black box phenomenon. You don't know exactly, okay, how does this work? And on one side, I uh, understand it, and it makes sense. You want to be sure that uh, you know what's going on. On the other hand, uh, sometimes uh, you want a result, and you don't really care about exactly how it works, because ultimately, uh, the risk is not that high. And so you have, to, you have to really think about what kind of risk management, how deep you want to look into it. And, um, but the, uh, the problem of transparency has been, uh, been researched a lot uh, because of course there are certain phenomena that touch the, uh, the social sphere. Like, and, and there we have to be careful. When it touches private data, how are its private data handled and so on, that is very important of course. Yeah, uh, Stu and I often, when we do these conversations, John as well, we often ask ourselves, okay, how far can we take AI and how far should we take AI? So maybe a couple of examples, if I may. Do you expect that within, let's say, the next 10, 15 years that machines will make better diagnoses than doctors? Oh, they already do. They already do. The okay. research has been shown that uh, in, in certain cases, specific cases, uh, 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 they have better accuracy. 
However, to bring that again into production uh, at, the, at the level that we go to the hospital and there's a machine that helps us uh, to diagnose, uh, well, it does, we're still at least some years away because there's all the process of, of certification. Um, and it must be added that on one side, it's really about uh, augmented intelligence rather than uh, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. Uh, the machines will help us diagnose, but then the responsibility should stay with the human. Another question we'd like to ask is around automobiles. Uh, do you think it will become the exception rather than the rule that individuals will, will own and drive their own automobiles? It's going to be the exception in the future that uh, there's going to be uh, an ownership and uh, a driving, uh, active driving. It's going to, it's, it's interesting because it's going to become uh, like uh, when it started, like a pleasure to drive. You drive because you want to drive. You're going to drive these, those hills up and down and really enjoy it. Otherwise, if you go to your, on your commute, uh, well, you have work to do. <laughs> yeah, I still have a stick shift. So yeah. You're <laughs> going to enjoy it. <laughs> now, I got to ask you, so the, the likes of Elon Musk and Hawking's have said, you know, projected that you know, AI is a bad thing, it's going to, machines will take over the world. You're, I don't sense that you're of that uh, uh, mindset, but what are your thoughts on that? Those dire predictions, are, are they ultimately going to come true or do you feel like they're overblown? Or uh, Who knows, but it's hard to forecast, but what are your thoughts on that? It's important to acknowledge these, um, these forecasts of a dire future mm. because um, AI is uh, capable of lots of things at scale and this is the, the key differentiator. So whatever you can do, you can do it at scale automatically, uh, things on their own. So it's more than, uh, than predicting a dire future, it's like, um, I'm to say, uh, developers, uh, managers, be careful of, of your choices because they're going to be uh, they're going to have an effect at scale, and and this is, is not just an AI rated effect. It's really like a technology rated effect because also if you look at AI today, there are lots of pieces that come together. Lots of pieces that come also from the big data era, and now they're being transformed. And you add a little bit of AI in the mix, but to make it work, there's a lot around it. So AI is the culprit because of the uh, science fiction uh, history and everything. But ultimately, uh, the ability to do things at scale automatically, that is really uh, the, uh, where we have to be careful. So, Nicola, what should we be looking for when we watch Cisco going forward for the, the next couple of years in this space? What, what, what are some key milestones that you think uh, we, we will come to reality? Well, we're going to release products that have more and more AI into it. And uh, the, uh, the whole industry, um, will evolve and have a better understanding of what's possible and what's not. And AI at Cisco revolves around three axes. One, infrastructure, tools that fit, and unique data. Infrastructure is how do we deal with increase of data, create these future-proof uh, networks. This is like our core uh, uh, business. The tools that fit is that we uh, provide end-to-end -end solutions to our customers and partners so that they can implement their AI ML uh, strategies. And it's, it, this is a really interesting topic because uh, AI ML is moving into the enterprise and other organizations, but it's still in the early stages because of all these operational uh, challenges which we at Cisco are very good at solving. And the third point is unique data. Unique in terms of volume, uh, breadth, uh, and, and type of data. This is where on one side we have systems that work at scale, but also we have kind of data that can be used by our customers to better understand their own business. All right, well, Nicola, really appreciate you giving us a you know, nice overview of all the areas for AI. Uh, Dave Vellante and I are still humans here uh, doing the <laughs> interviews here until the, the robots take over <laughs> all of our jobs. Until then, uh, thanks as always for watching theCUBE.